Thank you, Pacho Man. Welcome, everybody, back to our 11th year Breakfast with Bob. My name is Bob Babbitt. We're brought to you by Master Spas, S Fuels Go Longer, Hoka Let's Fly, Form Smart Swim Goggles, Quintana Roo Zoot, the original triathlon brand, and of course, our Challenge Athletes Foundation. Our next guest, three time silver medalist at the Ironman World Championship and Ironman 70.3 World Champion, Lucy Charles Barkley, joins us from her palatial state hidden somewhere on the big island of Hawaii. How you doing, Luz? Hey, Bob. Yeah, really good. Thank you. I'm actually coming to you from uh, Waikoloa, but I'm in the garage. So, yeah. Are you really- at Waikoloa? Yes. Yeah. Nice. So, your injury that you had. You're, you're coming off 70.3 worlds, finally get that world title. What happened injury wise? Oh, you know what? I mean, like you said, I was probably coming off of the highest high of my career so far, winning my first world title at the 70.3 worlds last year. Um, I had a good amount of downtime after that and then was obviously super motivated coming into this year. I had huge goals with obviously having a world championship race in May, trying to go for the sub eight project in June. And then knowing that the back end of the season would have PTO races, Kona and another 70.3 world. So I knew it was going to be a huge year and I was so up for it, so motivated. And then within a couple of months of training really, really well, really, really hard, um, I noticed a pain in my hip, um, which we acted on really, really quickly because I was concerned um, that it, it felt quite bad, it was ongoing. So um, we went and got a scan and then unfortunately there was a fracture in my femoral neck, um, which apparently is a really common injury for triathletes and runners, um, but it just takes its time to mend. And if you aren't smart with the injury, it can be really, really bad. So I was told to do absolutely nothing, which as an athlete is really, really tough to take. <laughs> Yeah, for someone like yourself who is always training and it's just it's your lifestyle. That's what you do. Not to be able to do anything. Were you going out of your mind? Yeah, I think thankfully Lola helped a lot. <laughs> yeah. a, um it was a great time for her. She got to spend loads of time with me on the sofa. I did venture out on dog walks on the crutches a little bit because I was on crutches for five weeks in total. Um and yeah, so I think that was probably the hardest part was when I really couldn't do anything and I just had to let my body mend, let my body rest. And I was extremely restless during that time. Uh, I just wanted to do anything I could, but I was told, you know what, you just got to listen to your body, let it mend. And the less you do, the faster this is going to happen. The nice thing about our sport is there's stuff happening all year long. So when you're forced to take time off, you say, okay, my the back half was the back quarter was going to be really important to me anyways you go to uh Samarin and win long distance championships there that's pretty cool and then that race just recently PTO US Open I mean Ashley Gentle Taylor Nib Lucy Charles being only three minutes back against two people who are focused entirely on shorter they're not coming to Kona they're not doing long distance that had a, you had to come away from that feeling like, okay, I'm where I need to be. Yeah, you know what? It was a, a mix of feelings after that race. I think, I mean, initially at the start of the year, it wasn't even going to be on my radar. Even if I wasn't injured, I was like, you know what? I think that might be a race too many if I was doing big yeah. races at the beginning and looking at Kona at the end. So it really did feel like a bonus race, even kind of um, then when you take into account the injury, I, I didn't know if I would be back racing at that point. So it was a great race to have. And I think actually it was really hot. So it kind of played out as a really good test run for Kona. Um, I definitely had a few things go wrong mechanically. Um, my battery actually died on my on my gear system. So I was stuck in the hardest gear for a bit. Um, yeah. And I had some issues with my nutrition dropping and other things. Yep. So it really felt like the race to get everything out the, the way that can go wrong, <laughs> and fix those issues, and then come to the big island and hopefully have those things resolved. So 
I was really happy with the result um, and I was just happy to be honest. At one point when the battery died on my bike, I thought it was going to be my first ever DNF and I was like, I don't do DNF, so this isn't going no. well. Um, and then actually, you know what, to finish on the podium after all of that, I was just really, really happy. And I think a good big session leading into Kona as well in the heat was, yeah, nothing to complain about. So, yeah, so you, you did a lot of training down there specifically for Kona. Yeah, I think, I mean, we we knew Dallas was going to be a super hot race, so it tied in really well. I was actually training in Lanzarote in the build-up to Dallas, and Lanzarote had actually been really hot as well. So it all was kind of playing really well leading into Dallas, but then at the back of my eyes, knowing the big race was going to be in Kona, which is always super hot and super humid. So a lot of good heat prep going into those two races. So, and if... There's somebody right now who's the hottest person on the circuit. Ashley Gentle has been on fire, winning, you know, both Dallas and Edmonton, a couple hundred thousand there. So being in the ballpark, even with everything that happened, you're in your biggest gear, your water bottles are flying all over the place. <laughs> it, it it looked like there was a little rust, right? Like, like, okay, I haven't really raced at a high level, high, high level of competition for a while. And all that stuff happened and you still got podium. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, you know what I mean? Um, fair play to Ashley Gentle. She's really come into her own over that 100K distance and it's yeah. really been great to see. She's already raising the bar over those races. So um, it's so competitive. And I think over that distance, it's almost short enough that if things go wrong, it can almost end your race. Whereas the thing yeah. I quite like about the iron distance is having a few issues you've almost got time to resolve them and come back it's a long enough race to fix them whereas it's quite intense over that 100k distance when things start to go wrong because you're like I don't know if I've got enough time to fix that or how am I going to overcome this how's my run going to be affected because it's a fast 18 kilometer run off the bike it's not a slightly less intense marathon so yeah it's a completely different ball game but I'm really enjoying kind of seeing how I fare over that 100k distance. I think it definitely does suit me having that longer swim. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I think the PTO is doing great things with that distance. Uh, no question. In fact, that my th feeling is if it wasn't for the PTO, we would have a lot of pros who would not still be in our world. They came out in 2019, 2020, and really saved a lot of people. And if, if you know, it's getting to the point now, when you look at the beginning of the season, if you got US Open, Canadian Open, Collins Cup, and if they add one or two others, which you're talking about, all of a sudden you've got $5 million races. <laughs> then you can <laughs> fill in around that if you feel like it, but you could just focus on those and it just makes life a lot easier as a professional, don't you think? I mean, it's game changing. Yeah, it, it makes it almost difficult as a professional to decide where to race. Do you target those races, which almost seems like the smart thing to do? It's where the prize money's at. And they're paying basically all the way to the final finish of your money Look, home. So yeah. it's it's a safe bet as an athlete. So, yeah. It, it's hard. How fun has it been being back on the Big Island after all that time away? Uh, it's been amazing being back here. I think, obviously, all of us have had three years away from the island. But for me personally, at the start of the year, I really didn't think I would be here. I thought it was a, a long shot to kind of even think about yeah. targeting race with the injury so it feels even more special being back here and I kind of always say like almost when you land on the island the hard work's pretty much done so you can just enjoy being here and I've definitely had that feeling of just I almost land on the island and I feel really chilled and relaxed but I think that's just because of the environment the beaches the scenery yes. it doesn't almost feel like you're here for the biggest race of the year but um, as you get closer to the race and, and things start to build up, you you understand why you're really here. But um, at the moment, I'm feeling pretty chilled, which is nice. So will you still focus on defending your title at 70.3 Worlds? I think, I mean, I'm definitely going to be going to 70.3 Worlds after this race. But I think if I want any shot at doing well here, I have to just almost forget that race. You have to go into this race yeah. doing it absolutely everything. So if I cross that line and I have nothing left and I can't go to 70.3 worlds, then fine. But um, at the moment, it, it is the plan too. But I won't be thinking about that at all during the race here. I have to think just about this race. They're just too close together. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you were you were at that. We were standing at the top of that downhill in the pouring rain. 
when you were coming around that turn and going down. That is a brutal. In fact, when I heard about your stress fracture, I, that's where I thought it came from. That those downhills are brutal, uh, especially running in the rain, coming down and doing it twice. It's, <laughs> it's hard to come away from something like that healthy. Yeah, it was a challenging course for sure. And I think it's actually going to be maybe slightly easier this time around. I think they have changed the run course slightly. I think it's still going to be challenging. I don't know if we still have to run down that crazy downhill at the end, but you've got to be a strong athlete to to do that course for sure. So hopefully my body does recover well from this one and I can go and do that race. But yeah, only time will tell. So you've been being second here three times obviously you want to you want to win this race what would it mean to you to to get this title since you've got the Ironman 70.3 world championship title I mean this is the title that I've always wanted obviously and I feel like because I've come so close getting that silver medal three times it yeah. it feels so in reach um so yeah I I this time I obviously feel different because I am off the back of an injury and I do just feel lucky to actually be here but yeah. I know what I'm like when I race I will give it a hundred percent and obviously if that's enough to get the win amazing it will be the greatest day of my career but if it isn't I know I will give it everything I've got so and you also have you know the 2019 champion Annie Hogg and then the five-time champion <laughs> Daniela Reef, who is at the top of her game again uh, which I bet you're excited about. You want to go against the best when they're or the, when they're on form. Absolutely. Like to race Daniela on her best day, that's what we all dream of. Like if you can actually come away and get the title and you were racing everyone on their best day, it means so much more. So obviously I'm so happy to see Daniela back at her best. Um, I'm excited to see what I can do and, and give my best as well. But yeah, it's going to be a really exciting race. The other thing is during COVID, I think you and your team did a phenomenal job of of staying relevant, of of doing uh, you know a lot of Zwift things, a lot of a lot of indoor training, and sharing what you were doing. Was that a conscious effort? Like, listen, we can't race right now. We need to do something. We want to take care of our sponsors. At the same time, it's an opportunity. It's obstacles can be opportunities, and I think you you and your team did the one of the best jobs of seizing that obstacle and making it a huge opportunity and really building your profile you're one of the most followed athletes in the sport was that something you guys had planned or just you rolled with it when you saw that the world wasn't open up anytime soon yeah I think one of the things with myself and my husband race is we're really bad at sitting still and doing nothing so we wanted to kind of just be as active as possible during that time and we knew a lot of people would be struggling. So we wanted to kind of share with them what we were trying to do, how we were still training a bit at home, but taking that pressure off because there was no racing. I think as an athlete, if there's not a massive goal to work towards, then it can be really difficult. So we were just trying to set smaller goals that obviously weren't major races, but we were targeting like the Zwift Pro Series that was happening, getting stuck into those online races and just trying to have as much fun as we could. And we, I think we did make the best out of what was obviously a really tough time for everyone. We, we did try and share as much advice as we could, the kind of training that we were doing indoors. And yeah, just trying to keep it as fun and as lighthearted as we could during that challenging time. You, you also last year, I was, thought it was so cool because you've, you've been that type of person to take chances and take risks and to jump in the Super League. Right. You're jumping in the Super League against this is what they do for a living. And you're jumping in with with these folks to to mix it up a little bit. And then you know, and same with the uh, with the virtual race, not the virtual race, but the, uh, the the Crystal Palace there where you guys raced on the treadmill and race on a treadmill and, and on the treadmill on the stationary bike and then swam. You, you seem like the type of person who just, hey, if that opportunity is there. I'm going for it because I've yeah, I really have nothing to lose. Yeah, I think I've always been quite like that, but I think actually during the pandemic when everything was taken away from us, I knew that as soon as things started to open up again, I was going to just say yes to every opportunity that I got. So going and racing in the Super League, going and doing the arena games, um, going and doing the Olympic trials and swimming, 
all of those things I probably wouldn't normally have done, but actually it pushed me out of my comfort zone. I learned yeah. new things about myself and then it set me up to have an amazing 70.3 worlds. So actually all of it seemed to work really, really well. And um, I had a lot of fun with it too. Goals for next year? Have you even started to think about <laughs> that yet? Um, I haven't thought about next year yet. I think obviously coming into this season super late, normally by this point in the season, I'm quite tired. Like I would have raced a lot, whereas I feel probably the most fresh I've ever felt going into Kona and having another race afterwards with such a big race. I think I'll, I'll get these two big races out of the way first and then we'll kind of assess what next year's looking like. And like we said, there seems to be more opportunities than ever to race at the highest level. So it's going to be a difficult um, planning period in the off season, but um, yeah, I'm excited for next year. And obviously it feels good to be healthy again. And that's my main focus is to, continue staying healthy and looking after myself. I always look at like when one door closes, another one opens up. If you think <laughs> back 2012, 10 years ago, you're basically your swimming career. You didn't make the team in, in the pool or open water. And you could have just said, okay, it's been a great career. You know, Reese and I, we're going to go on get married and we're going to go do our thing. And instead you jump into this little sport of triathlon and basically create an entirely new career and a bigger career. When you look back at that and that decision, of, ah, we'll just jump into a race here and see what happens and look how far it's come. You've got to look back and go, that was a pretty damn good decision. <laughs> yeah, I think it's probably the best decision we ever made. And we made that decision not knowing what the future would hold. We we signed up for that first ever Ironman triathlon as something to do, a big challenge and something that we could almost have on our CV. We were both personal trainers at the time and we were like, well, that looks pretty good if we've, we've done an Ironman. We must know a bit what we're talking about um, in terms of coaching in the gym. And it <laughs> escalated a lot further than we thought. Um, <laughs> that is so funny. You're basically just trying to say, hey, this way, we're not just going to be coaches for swimming. We can coach triathlon because we, hey, we did an Ironman. <laughs> and, and then you become basically the world champion. That's, I love those stories. And and for the people, for a lot of the athletes, like you said, you you pretty much opened yourself up during COVID time for more people to connect with you. And when you hear from these people that, hey, what you're doing has got me out of the house. It's got me. I've lost 30 pounds. I found this sport because of you. It, this can be sort of a selfish sport. You swim, you bike, you run, you, you know, you you do social stuff about yourself. But when you hear those stories. I'm guessing that fuels you to be even better because you know you're impacting other lives. Yeah, I think, I mean, I've I've been out training before and say been on a training run and felt terrible and wanted to stop. And I remember there was a young girl walking with her mum and she was like, look how good at running that lady is. And I was like, oh my God, in, self, in myself, I'm suffering and finding it really hard. But that has had a small act on that one person in their day and in their life. So I think it's so heartwarming to hear these stories when people reach out to me and say, particularly actually with my injury, when I was sharing the journey with that and how they were like, I feel like I can overcome my struggles now because we've heard how you're dealing with this. And there's no doubt it was really, really tough dealing with that injury, but it almost helped sharing it with other people and them telling me, Hey Lucy, I've, got the similar injury and I feel like I can overcome it now so hearing those positive things is just I find it strives me on to do better like you said definitely and it helps me when I'm struggling to think actually these people look up to me and I need to keep pushing just so that I can keep doing that well because of the, the of these folks they it would have been very easy for you to go a little incognito sharing injury sharing disappointment it's not easy to do but by doing that, you let people see another side. It's one thing to show, here I am breaking another finish tape. Here I am winning another silver medal. But it's hard to show, here I am in a cast. Here I am on crutches. And today was not a good day. Uh, I got the scan back and I, my season could be over. That, that's hard to do. Was, was that difficult for you? Yeah, I think actually in the beginning, it was really hard when we were starting to learn about the injury and I was starting to feel the pain and we didn't know what it was. And then we found out the extent of it and you kind of almost feel like you have 
the world on your shoulders before anyone actually knows about it and people start to speculate that things aren't going quite right and actually once I got to the point where I could tell everyone what had happened and obviously the first thing I had to do was tell all of my amazing sponsors that right. I had this degree and that it was going to take me out potentially the whole year and then once they were incredibly supportive then we kind of could tell the wider community okay this is what we're dealing with this is why I won't be on start lines this year and it kind of got easier from that point onwards once everyone did know. And I think one of the hard things in this day and age is there's so much opinion that is out there online and why people thought the injury happened. And I actually felt like, you know what, I want to share the injury and not only just help people to not get this injury, but share why it happened, how I can overcome it and how I can be better so that people know the truth of why it happened. And then they can obviously prevent that from happening to them as well because like I said it is actually quite a common injury for runners and triathletes. What did you gain from dealing with that from just dealing with the disappointment and just the whole rehab process obviously you've rehabbed before but this was this is a little more serious than some of the stuff you've done before. Yeah so one of the main things we learned with this injury was that the way that I have swam over the years has impacted the way that I run. So biomechanically, there were a few issues going on, which they did believe had come from swimming, where I only breathed to one side for so many years. So my mm -hmm. spine actually had a slight twist in it, which we thought was caused um, from just kind of being breathing to one side, which a coach when I was a swimmer at the time did say, you should breathe bilaterally, you should breathe to both sides and you'll be more balanced. But at the time as a swimmer, I did always swim faster breathing to one side. So I was ignoring that advice, but kind of once we, we learned that it was really important for me to then go in the gym and build that strength, build that balance back up and actually know that I'm not just going to prevent the injury from happening again, but I'm going to be a stronger, more efficient runner at the end of it as well. So that was a huge positive to know that actually once we overcome this, I should be stronger as well. And I guess on the flip side, that's looking at the physical side, but obviously mentally it was extremely tough to sit out of those major races. And it gave me so much more motivation and fire not being there and having to watch, but it was really tough at the time because I couldn't actually train while those races were going on. So it was almost like, let's bottle up that motivation and slowly let it out once I'm allowed to train again. I love it. Hey, Lucy, you have a great race next week. So excited to see you back here in Kona. It's going to be an amazing week. And I, I just having the women race, your own race, that, that's got to be pretty fun, too. Yeah, I mean, it's exciting for us. We have the stage all to ourselves. And normally the male athletes, I'm trying to chase them down. But it's yes. probably going to be me, I would expect, close to the front in that swim and be the first person going up the road hopefully so yeah it's a it's going to be different because I do like to catch the men uh they're not going to be there anymore I'm going to have to just imagine they're out front in that swim but yeah it, <laughs> it's really cool that we get our own day and I think it's going to be great I think a lot of guys are pretty happy about that that you're not <laughs> going to be chasing them down nobody likes having so, get uh, Cam Worth was telling me he came out of the water one year and he's like, oh my God, I look under my shoulder and there's Lucy right there. <laughs> I wanted to get out of the frame. I didn't want people to see me getting uh, Lucy running right by me. Lucy, yes. thanks again for taking time. You're always such a treat to chat with and we'll uh, we'll see you on race day and and hopefully at the championship edition at Four Seasons. That's sort, uh, of, that's sort of a tradition, right? Yeah, fingers crossed I will be there because um, yeah, it's a good tradition, that one. I love it. Lucy Charles Barkley has been our guest, everybody. Again, Breakfast with Bob from beautiful Hawaii. We're on Zoom, but Lucy will be there on race day. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. See ya.